But I am going to talk to you about a very important topic tonight called adverse childhood experiences. Before I continue, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I want to make sure that everyone's able to hear me. Uh, there is a plethora of information on adverse childhood experiences, which is also known as ACEs out there. So really what I'm going to present to you tonight is an overview. I'm just going to be scratching the surface, hopefully, hopefully give you some useful information, take away some uh, new ideas uh, to manage adverse childhood experiences and uh, get a better uh, feeling for what the community is doing about adverse childhood experiences. So before uh, I start, uh, you know, let's talk about what kind of childhood experiences uh, that are challenging. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions to get an idea of who we have here in the audience. And, and you can participate if you want. You don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, but if, if I could ask you to stand up, if you, during your childhood, you had parents or your caregivers were divorced or separated at some time during your childhood. Keep standing. If a member of your household, a caregiver, or anyone that was a member of your household suffered from mental illness or a substance abuse or dependence issue, please stand. If you experienced poverty during childhood, please stand. As you can see, looking around, there's a lot of people out there that experience childhood adversity. I think you can sit down. We're not alone, and that's why I wanted to start this out. I want you to realize a lot of people experience adversity, and we're going to talk about what encompasses adversity because there there's more than just what we just uh mentioned there's a lot more to this we're going to talk about uh some of the challenges that challenges that children are facing out there and when i say adversity think of adversity as uh, difficulties hardships trauma uh this is really what is encompassing adversity and that's why we call it aces because it's adverse childhood experiences and there's an assessment of ACEs out there, and we'll talk about what that entails that kind of targets um, the, the scope of adversity that children are experiencing. So originally, the study, see, this is where I'll see if I start walking around, this will be a problem. Uh, it, it, initially, the origin of the study was in the 90s, and we saw it started at Kaiser Permanente in California, and in conjunction with the CDC, and they did a basically study on their patients. And they had a, an original questionnaire of ACEs that scored from zero to eight. Zero meaning you experienced no ACEs as a child, eight meaning you scored, uh, you know, the, the most that the questionnaire would assess. Um, this was expanded and went to the, what is currently on the ACEs, which is 10 questions with uh, an experience of 10 different ACEs versus uh, zero ACEs or anywhere in between. Um, this was uh, uh, conducted with over 17,000 adult participants, and these adults were patients at the Kaiser Permanente, which uh, meant they had a full health record on the patients, including uh, you know, uh, what health conditions they had currently, their childhood experiences, and then they added this questionnaire so that they could look at how those are related. They found a very strong correlation between uh, adverse experiences during childhood and some of the major health problems that we're dealing with in adulthood in the United States. So this is... Uh, uh, been extensively studied, and this was kind of the original study. So if you look at this, you'll see um, the original study at Kaiser Permanente, 36.1% uh, of their 17,337 participants uh, had zero ACEs. And, and as you can see, it goes up, there's one ACE, 
two ACE, three ACE, four ACEs, 12.5% of their original study had adverse childhood experiences. Whereas this gave them some groundbreaking evidence to expand this uh, study. And uh, it went into a 23 uh, multi-state uh, study where they actually included over 200,000 participants in that study. And they were showing even higher rates of adverse childhood experiences with almost 16% of the adults having four or more childhood uh, uh, adverse childhood experiences, which is um, unfortunate, right? If we think about our community and some of the hardship that, that we're having, these are children that we're uh, seeing have these um, issues. So let's talk about what is included in the adverse childhood experiences in that assessment. It can be basically broken into three categories. Um, the first category being a category where there's questions related to abuse. It could be physical abuse, emotional abuse, or sexual abuse. Um, could be related to neglect, physical or emotional neglect. These first two categories are specifically related to the child's experience directly. Whereas when you go into um, the third category, which includes the household challenges, these are just usually uh, the challenges that the children were exposed to, the, the children uh, at, within the family. One of them being, as we uh, earlier had stated, mental illness. Uh, if someone in the family had mental illness, that's an adverse childhood experience. Family violence, so maybe not specifically towards the child, but even the child witnessing uh, domestic violence or family violence. Uh, separation or divorce, or even a death of a loved one uh, could be included in this uh, household challenges. Children with a family member who's incarcerated during childhood or um, loved ones, family members with substance abuse or dependence. So these are pretty um, direct questions and can be captured with an assessment of 10 questions, which we'll look at. So let's, let's look at what the questionnaire looks like. And I'll, you guys can go ahead and, and tally your own adverse childhood experiences, if you would like. Well, I read them aloud, and it'll be easier for me just to read it from the paper rather than from here. So let's look at the first. Did you uh, feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, or had to had no one to protect or care for you? That's the first one. Did you lose a parent through separation, divorce, abandonment, death, or other reasons? Did you live with anyone who was depressed, mentally ill, or attempted suicide? Did you live with anyone who had a problem with drinking or using drugs, including prescription drugs? Did your parents or adults in your home ever hit, punch, beat, or threaten to harm each other? Did you live with anyone that went to jail or prison? Did a parent or adult in your home ever swear at you, insult you, or put you down? Did a parent or adult in your home ever hit, beat, kick, or physically hurt you in any way? Did you feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were special? And did you experience unwanted sexual contact? These are the 10 questions. These are an abbreviated version of the questions, but they're focused and what you would find in the original assessment. And so if you were to tally, you could determine uh, how many ACEs you experienced during childhood, the first 18 years of your life. If you tallied up zero, you should feel fortunate because as we could see just from the room at the, in the original questions, the majority of us had at least one of the first three ACEs that I had mentioned. And, and so a, a lot of our population out there does experience ACEs. And as um, the... Uh, Critical information was slipped by our lovely announcer. 61% of, of the population has at least one ACE. And uh, four or more, more ACEs is contained by 16% of the population. Four or more ACEs. Think about those 10 ACEs. 
16 percent of the population have four or more. This is could be detrimental to have these ACEs, and we're finding a lot of research that is is tying this directly to health issues. But there are other things to think about besides just those 10 ACEs, especially in the world we live in. So if you look at uh, ACEs, uh, it could be beyond just our home within the house. And so we do need to take that into consideration that there might be more out there than just those 10 questions. Things like uh, poor housing, community disruption, uh, poverty, discrimination, uh, violence within the community. These could be additional ACEs that we're not actually measuring within those first 10 questions. So these are some things that I, I want you to take into consideration that could be potential ACEs as well or adverse childhood experiences. So um, taking that into consideration, why is this such a big deal? Um, besides the fact that we're raising children and exposing them to such adversity, it is because it, it is a, a stimulating what is known as this toxic stress response. This prolonged activation of our stress response system. How, how many of you have heard of the fight or flight system? Right? Exactly. That's really what is being activated in that. And if that is activated enough and over a pro prolonged period of time, you can have actual um, disruption in some of our systems that could target development, brain development, uh, the architecture of our brain, uh, problems with the organ systems, uh, immunities, these types of things, so disease, cognitive impairment. These are all issues that we're actually seeing are directly tied to having adverse childhood experiences. So uh, this can be seen in data which has been collected, which show a clear relationship between the ACE scores, uh, the number of adverse childhood experiences, and common diseases. So here's what we're looking at. Our top 10 leading causes of death in the U.S. Nine out of 10 of these diseases have been correlated with uh, ACEs. And specifically, as you can see, four or more ACEs uh, has a risk for heart disease of 2.1 times the risk of someone with zero ACEs. So 2.1 times the risk for heart disease if you have four or more ACEs. Um, you can just go down the line, 11.2 times the risk with Alzheimer's disease, 37.5 times the risk for suicide. This is kind of jaw-dropping if you really think about it, that how much ACEs are impacting adult health and, and, and can actually be tragic if we look at our health in adulthood and, and some of the health problems that we see in our society. This is really big scale stuff, but we can see this on a smaller scale as well. If you look at just ACEs and then the prevalence of smoking, current smokers uh, addicted to nicotine, as the ACEs go up, oops, sorry, as ACEs go up, hitting all the wrong buttons, four to five ACEs, six or more ACEs, we're way up here, 16% of the population having uh, an addiction to smoking uh, if they have six or more ACEs, whereas under 6% uh, are addicted to cigarettes uh, with zero ACEs. So you can see this pattern, this rise in the prevalence of smoking just based on ACEs. It's a direct correlation that is occurring. Uh, another um, an example of this is with ACEs and the prevalence of alcohol dependence. You can see the same patterns. As the number of ACEs increase, the prevalence of alcohol dependence increases. This has been studied over and over and over again with uh, these assessments of adults and the reported number of ACEs and their health outcomes and what is going on out there in the real world. Um, so 
it, we think of things, these large scale cancer, there's a lot of things that can influence cancer. But when you start narrowing it down to these smaller behaviors, these smaller, more direct um, health uh, issues, it starts becoming real. It starts becoming obvious that there's this connection between adverse childhood experiences and um, the impacts, the poor health impacts. So with that being said, I'm going to be really dramatic here. This is my big drama moment. So somebody can give me a drum roll, you know. Uh, this, this is a public health crisis. It truly is a public health crisis. It, we need to recognize it as a public health crisis because ACEs, these adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress are a cause of some of the, some of the most harmful, expensive, problematic and persistent societal health and health challenges that we're facing in current society. This, this is really um, where we're, we need to take a, a long, hard look. At, at our society and go, okay, how can we address this? How do we address this? It, one way is doing exactly what you're doing. You're coming and you're learning about it so, so that we can start addressing these issues. So kudos to you for taking the first step. So here's some uh, kind, of a, a, kind of an entryway into how this impacts biologically uh, with adverse childhood experiences and that toxic toxic stress response. This can start as early as during prenatal, uh, you know, in the womb, this can start. Hormones, those stress hormones uh, prenatally can start this pattern. Um, you know, a postnatal caregiver, all of uh, the 10 adverse childhood experiences that we talked about in depriving environments, child abuse or neglect, all of this acts on us biologically by activating that toxic stress response. So activating that toxic stress response it is okay if it, it's brief. But when it's long-term, over chronic, over a long period of time, we start seeing these major biological changes. We see DNA being read and transcribed uh, in inappropriately changes to that, which is called epigenetics, reprogramming of the stress and immune system so that we're not able to tolerate stress as well. We're um, having our immune systems impacted of uh, the systems related to health and neurodevelopmental issues are being impeded. So our ability to learn, our ability to have uh, to have memory, our ability to function at the highest level possible in, in our lifespan. These are all some of the kind of an, an entryway into the uh, biological systems that are being interrupted by the toxic stress that is directly uh, the result of adverse childhood experiences. Bear with me a moment here. I'm doing all the talking, so I needed water. <laughs> so let's take a look at this. Not all stress is bad, but really not all stress is bad. There is good stress. There's positive stress. So be aware. There is positive stress. Stress is good for us. If it's, if it's limited, it's in small doses, it's appropriate levels of stress. So when you look at this positive stress, you know, we can look at it seeing just a uh, very short term. So an exam, a tough exam, uh, a wedding. <laughs> Weddings can be stressful, right? But it's a positive thing that they can be stressful. Me coming up here and lecturing in front of 50 strangers is stressful. Believe it or not, it is stressful. But it's a positive stress. It's a good thing. Heart rate gets pumping. Your blood gets flowing. You know, this this is normal, tolerable stress. It, it, and then it, it, positive stress that can even be tolerable stress, which, it, again, it could be more serious stress. Uh, stress can be serious, but tolerable. Uh, you, you, you know, if you lose a loved one, if you have a death of a loved one, it doesn't seem tolerable at the time. It definitely doesn't. But it can be tolerable. If it's buffered by relationships, positive relationships, 
people that care about you. If you have supportive relationships, that is buffered and can be a tolerable stress. Natural disasters can be a tolerable stress. If, if you have loved ones that are supportive and, and nurturing. When we start getting into the toxic stress is when it's prolonged stress. That prolonged stress is long periods of time of stress. This is often in absence of protective relationships. So those people that you can lean on and find support from and, and, and uh, to mitigate that the excessive stress that you would feel um, aren't there. And this is often when you have abuse, neglect, um, caregivers are, are just kind of a absent because of things like substance abuse, independence. Um, this is where toxic stress can happen, and this is over prolonged periods of time. But even this is not that simple, unfortunately. Even this, so this seems simplistic, but this isn't even as simple as this, because believe it or not, there's other things going on. So we'll talk about pretty soon these protective factors and some predisposing factors that could either worsen uh, as far as the predisposing uh, vulnerability that can worsen the toxic stress or the protective factors that can buffer the effects of toxic stress. And within toxic stress, this long-term physiological response, it is targeting our, our neurodevelopment, our brain development, the endocrine system, and our immune system. And we'll kind of break that down and look at what some of the specific mechanism are, mechanisms are that are occurring when we have this prolonged toxic stress response. <clears throat> So first and foremost, some of you, this might look like gibberish. I'm going to try to summarize because there's a lot, you know, many of you uh, have maybe taken Psych 101 and you had some of this, some of you haven't, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll simplify to some extent. So dysregulation of the stress response system. There's kind of these systems, these axes. The, uh, the SAM axis, we'll use the abbreviation just to uh, um, the sympathetic adrenal medulla uh, axis, we'll, we'll kind of use SAM axis because that's for short term and acute stress. So that shorter term stress that's activated. Then it goes into the HPA axis, which is our um, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. Now we're talking about long term stress. These systems, if they're um, uh, targeted by this toxic stress enough, there's disruption. It is what happens is you end up here, the health later in adulthood. You end up either uh, not being able to modulate stress. Stress is occurring at, at times that it maybe is inappropriate, not useful, or you can have blunted stress. That stress response is just disrupted and not functioning optimally. Um, there's actual, like I said, the architecture of the brain is impacted. So you have the, the amygdala, uh, the, the size of the amygdala is altered. There's a, a reactivity in the amygdala that's altered. The amygdala is often what we know is that kind of that part of the brain that it, it is, is functioning with that fight or flight it is really what it's doing. It also uh, it very much is part of our fear, that fear response, which could be problematic if we have an increased fear response, impulsivity and aggression. So you could see some of the issues in long-term uh, adulthood uh, issues. Uh, then there's the inhibition of the prefrontal cortex. As humans, our prefrontal cortex is right here, at the, the front of our uh, brain. And that's really, that's what makes us human. That, that is, it's, it's our higher level thinking. It's where we plan, we problem solve, we, uh, you know, make our decisions that way. We are uh, using this part of the brain to maintain impulse control. It controls our impulses, emotional regulation. Imagine, uh, you know, what that could look like in an adulthood if that is impeded and problematic. Uh, a lot of issues could be going on there. 
Hippocampus neurotoxicity, that's the difficulty with learning and memory. Again, some major problems down the road. The ventral tegmental area and reward processing uh, dysregulation is occurring with long-term uh, toxic stress. And, and that's talk, we're talking about increased risky behavior and risk for addiction. Think about the two slides I showed you with the, the, the substance dependence, issues with alcohol dependence, issues with nicotine dependence, directly tied to some of these areas neurologically that are being impacted by long-term uh, toxic stress. So that's just our neurological. That's just neurological. We also, uh, you know, can have impacts on our immune system, on our immune, uh, our immune system. So we can have inhibition of anti-inflammatory pathways. All of these immunity issues can lead to things of uh, risk of infection, autoimmune disorders, cancer, chronic inflammation. These are major health impacts long time lifespan issues that are directly tied to adverse childhood experiences. So it, it's not just one thing that is happening. It's many, many things. Oh, lastly, we'll talk about the endocrine system. So we're talking about changes in growth, growth hormones. And, and with that is developmental problems. We have uh, pubertal uh, issues and events being disrupted. Uh, we also have changes to things like leptin, glucose. These are things that it can be tied directly to um, having difficulty with weight management and obesity and diabetes, which are problems. We have these problems in, in our society today. And much of this can be tied to increased adverse childhood experiences, these health impacts. So to depress you just a little more. <laughs> Had to have a little thing where you lighten it up, right? Uh, well, let's look at this kind of on a smaller scale because this is a lot. This is a lot to bite off and shoot. It really is. I, I'm not going to test you on this before you leave. But, but let's look at it on a small scale. The neuron is basically a, a cell in our nervous system. It's the smallest cell within our nervous system that basically transmits messages, communicates across our nervous system. We need these to be able to communicate information effectively across our nervous system. As you can see, normal neuron has lots of connections so that we can easily transmit messages and smoothly transmit messages without any disruption and delay. When you have toxic stress over time, you can see there are less connections, damaged neurons and fewer connections, meaning you're not sending and receiving messages across your nervous system as a person without experiencing toxic stress. This could be a, a huge, issue when we're talking about things like the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus. Think about that. Your impulse control, your higher level thinking, your planning, uh, being able to make judgments, uh, uh, having a lack of connections in those neurons is going to be really problematic. The hippocampus related to memory and learning. Now we're talking about uh, long-term issues. As a child, it's, it's just in itself, without the biological aspect, if you're stressed, terribly stressed, it's really going to be difficult to be focusing on learning, right? Very difficult to focus on learning if you're overly stressed. Now imagine the damage in addition to that stress, the damage that's happened with, uh, across the neurological system uh, as well. Um, and in a worst case scenario, um, we can actually see brain architecture uh, being impacted dramatically. So on the left is a normal three-year-old child's brain. This is a three-year-old child uh, from Russia that experienced extreme sensory deprivation, a, a basically severe child neglect is what happened. The, the brain is smaller in size. That's where the architecture is directly impacted. The ventral uh, ventricles are enlarged. There's just less brain matter overall. 
that is occurring, which really is probably a worst case scenario, is what this is. Now, does this mean that if you have four or five or six ACEs, that your brain looks like this? No. <laughs> this is a worst case scenario, but it really is because, uh, truthfully, we can have things happen in our life that buffers the toxic stress. And that, that's what I want to make sure that you walk away with. Because truthfully, when I looked around, many of us have ACEs. You know, I have many ACEs. And this is why this, to me, is so impactful. Because I'm like, what the heck? I have all these ACEs. This is my brain look like this? And, and, and no, I wouldn't be standing here right now. Uh, doing this lecture if it did. Uh, so I want to also give you some uh, information about the things that can be protective uh, with adverse childhood experiences. So this is the worst case scenario in, in that uh, CT scan. Now we're gonna go to the part of this lecture where I'm a little bit more upbeat, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't end it on that. Uh, so there is these protective and compensatory experiences. Um, paces. This, this to me is the antidote to ACEs, is what these are. Paces. Uh, these are protective factors. So toxic stress can actually be buffered with paces. And so we'll look at, at, at what is included with paces. And, sorry, yeah, here we go. So protective and compensatory experiences gives us some hope. Uh, for those of us who have experienced ACEs, some of us experiencing many ACEs. And in fact, we need to realize if, if you just took the ACEs, you'd probably be traumatized because you'd be like, ah, oh, this is horrible. It's kind of a very traumatic thing to look at just ACEs alone. And I really feel like you should always look at PACEs as well because uh, they go hand in hand. So with uh, PACEs, we can look at certain protective factors. So protective factors are things that basically buffer um, these adverse childhood experiences. They, they can help uh, alleviate the detrimental effects from adverse childhood experiences. Uh, one of them being the social emotional competence of a child. Some children are just more emotionally competent than other children. They, they're able to handle things a little bit better. So that in itself is a very protective factor. It really is. Support in times of need. It doesn't have to be directly within the home if there's support outside of the home. It, that is a protective factor. Um, social connections. So support of social connections. So there might not be family within the household that are uh, supportive. But if there's family outside or friends, neighbor, any, any of that can be these supportive social connections. And exactly what you're doing right now is learning about parenting and child development so that you can take steps to break the cycle, basically, to just narrow it down. This is protective. This is protective to our future generations and the future children. So these are all protective factors as well. So uh, uh, when we look at this, these are we're, we're mitigating uh, what would normally be the toxic stress response. We're kind of finding a way to um, uh, uh, alleviate some of the, the long-term effects of that. So I kind of break it out into two different things, uh, mitigating that toxic stress. Intrinsic factors, is basically what's within us as an individual. I, I think it is like, you know, we have all these biological systems that can be impacted from toxic stress, but some people are just built tough, right? And so in some ways, those people that have these protective factors biologically might just do better. In general, they, they might not have as many uh, health impacts as the person that maybe doesn't have those protective factors or 
has actual generational toxic stress that's been passed on, uh, which it can can occur. Um, believe it or not, children who uh, are curious and, and, and want to learn, uh, they have the ability to pay attention, they have better uh, emotional regulation. These children have what I would consider intrinsic factors that are built in within them that could help protect them from the effects of adverse experiences. Extrinsic factors, like I talked about, are these relationships, having buffering relationships. It could be a neighbor. It could be a friend. It could be a teacher. It could be a coach. But buffering relationships that, that can kind of counterbalance, counteract uh, the adverse uh, experiences. Supportive environments, community through community and resources. So this is something that to me is very important. Hopefully you'll walk away and you'll want to be an advocate for uh, creating more community resources uh, and support for children who are struggling with adverse experiences because that we're finding are some really important uh, external things that can help mitigate the toxic stress experiences. So obviously as a society, we would like to just not have ACEs, right? But, you know, we have to be realistic too um, because, you know, we can't just take care of everything all at once. I wish we could. We wish we could live in a world where no, everyone has a zero ACEs. Zero. But and until we get there, we have to learn how to cope with ACEs and, and to be able to buffer the ACEs that are out there and, and create a society where there is uh, some protection. Because uh, unfortunately, I don't see in the very new, near future us having zero ACEs for everybody, unfortunately. So that's where PACEs comes in. Because believe it or not, PACES is a little bit more optimistic. It goes in conjunction with ACEs. Um, PACES, it, it's, a, it's basically a measurement of those protective uh, and compensatory experiences that could be considered the antidote to ACEs. So the PACES uh, study was in 2015. It was a questionnaire. And basically, it, it seems pretty obvious, but the higher number of cases was associated with lower ACEs. That seems obvious, right? But what was also found is that it, it provided evidence that cases provided this um, protective, uh, this protective factor or buffering uh, of against the negative health impacts of ACEs uh, of the adverse childhood experiences. So let's look at what the PACES questionnaire considers as protective and compensatory experiences. So here's where we get to do a little self-evaluation again. So with this, uh, right, did you have someone who loved you unconditionally? You had no doubt that they cared for you. Did you have at least one best friend, someone you could trust and have fun with? Did you do anything regularly to help others or do special projects in the community to help others? Were you regularly involved in organized sports groups or athletics? Were you an active member of at least one civic group or non-sport social group, such as scouts, religious group, or a youth group? Did you have an engaging hobby? It could be artistic, intellectual, it could be you know, alone or as a group, a musical instrument, even reading, any kind of, of hobby uh, that was engaging. Was there an adult, not your parent, that you trusted and could count on when you needed help or advice? This could be a coach, a teacher, a neighbor, anyone. Was your home typically clean and safe with enough food to eat? Overall, did your schools provide the resources and the academic experiences that you needed to learn? In your home, were there rules that were clear and fairly administered? These are all protective factors. And if you'll notice, there is a number 11. You know, because everyone has different experiences. You might have a, a pace that isn't here. 
It might be something else. For me, I grew up with animals. Those are my pace. My animals were my pace. So it could be unique to you. It, it really can be unique to you. So when you take this into consideration and you add up your paces, that looks a little bit more optimistic, right? When you think of that. And, 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 and that's what I want you to understand is that aces aren't a standalone. You don't need to feel hopeless by just focusing on those aces. Because overall is what the paces does is it balances the aces. So if you just had aces and no paces, it, I mean, that would be really heavy, a heavy load to carry and could be very detrimental. When you look at health outcomes, though, the paces could kind of balance you out you know, like a teeter-totter. That's what I always think of as a teeter-totter. Balance it out so those health impacts aren't quite as detrimental long term. Those protective factors buffer the toxic stress response and, and allow for uh, kind of an interruption of all of those biological and neurological uh, health uh, issues that we were seeing uh, previously. So this might be an explanation for maybe why some people have many adverse childhood experiences and seem to do fine in life. This is one re way of thinking about that is, is how is it someone can have a bunch of aces and still be okay, still function and, and still uh, do well. And, and I always think about that person that, that even though they had multitudes of aces, they still thrived. They didn't just survive, they thrived. How, how do we explain that? And this is what I want to talk about. There's lots and lots and lots of, of theories and research out there about how this occurs. But I'm, I want to talk about some of the ways that we can help make this occur and, and, and get there, because there are things that we can do. And one of the things that we can do is find and build resilience. To me, that is a key factor is being resilient. So resilience basically is the ability to bounce back. That's what I think of it as, that ability to bounce back. When you have adversity, you're able to recover. Now, this doesn't come naturally for everyone. It really doesn't. Sometimes it takes practice to be resilient. But that's, there's good news. It can be learned. Resilience can be learned. So let's talk about some of the things that we can do and, and, uh, to learn resilience. And we'll start basically with the foundation of resilience. And we'll look at what kind of things or characteristics do resilient people have? Let's look at that. So some of the traits and characteristics of those people who are resilient. Viewing change as a challenge or an opportunity. Change is a positive thing. They're not resisting change or avoiding change or fearful of change. They're accepting of change. Engaging in support of others. Asking for help. Seeking support. Not withdrawing uh, in, in the face of, uh, of stress. Self-efficacy, meaning they feel like they have some control in their own life, having control in their own life, which might sound contradictory to the next, which says a realistic sense of control, right? Knowing that you have control of your own life is great, but overly thinking about needing to control everything can be bad on the other end of the spectrum. Understanding that you can't control everything and having real, realistic expectations of control. A sense of humor. Look, I'm a prime example, right? <laughs> having a sense of humor is a buffer. It, it's a good thing. This is part of being resilient, being optimistic. You know, the glass is half full rather than the glass is half empty. This is part of, of what we see as a resilience. Having goals, either individually as a, a person or collectively, a shared goal. Faith it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a diehard religious person, but faith is absolutely uh, shown to have some uh, uh, nurturing of resilience. Absolutely. 
Patience is key. Being able to be patient because we need to know that not everything happens immediately. And the ability to maintain positive relationships. Now, does every person who is resilient have all of these? No. But we see that people who do have resilience have some or many of these. And, and some of these things can actually be groomed. And we can practice and build on these and, and, and learn to get closer and closer to having the characteristics of someone who is resilient. So let's look at how we can do that. Because really, that's what we want to know, right? Is how. So this is where you get we get to focus more on what do you do when you're an adult and you, and you have aces? Like how do you deal with that? How how do you buffer the aces? Because you can't go back in time. As much as I'd love to go back in time and change things, I'd really love to be thirty again. That was really nice. <laughs> that, that, that's not I, I haven't found a way to go back in time. So you can't go back in time. So you have to deal with what you've got, right? You really do. You have to deal with what you've got. So some of the steps, these are ways that we can build resilience. Recognize when you have stress and where your stress is coming from. So signs of stress. Sometimes if you deal with a lot of stress, you get so wrapped up in it that you don't even know how stress is being uh basically expressed in your body. I, whenever I'm stressed, I have headaches. I end up having shoulder pain and neck pain. Does anybody else have body issues when they feel stress, headaches, things like that? Absolutely. Recognizing that and knowing when that's occurring is, is really important because then you can start recognizing in some of the bad habits that you might engage in when you're stressed. Some people eat when they're stressed. Some people drink out more alcohol when they're stressed. Some people withdraw from society when they're stressed. Recognizing that and it, that these are some bad habits that are occurring can be very groundbreaking in making some changes. Focus on building physical hardiness. Yes, uh, this is my research right here. This is, this is, this is, this is it. Small changes. This is exciting for me. Because has anybody ever tried to make a major life change? I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to start exercising. I'm going to be, you know, have all this good nutrition, do all this stuff. And you just, you pummel on all of this, these changes and it becomes too much, right? How do we feel when it doesn't work out? Not so great, right? It feels pretty devastating. But part of the thing is, is that we've tried to change too many things and too many big things all at once. Especially when you dealt with toxic stress over your lifespan, you want to start small. You want to start small with small changes. Implement some small things into your health. Just drink more water. How, how, how small could you get? That's really small, but it's a health benefit. Drink more water. You know, uh, eat a little bit better nutrition. A little exercise, those types of things. Doesn't mean you have to do it all at once. Is what you start realizing is, oh, I'm going to make this one small change. And then when you're successful at that change, over time, you can add another small change. Next thing you know, you've got all these small changes that you have slowly implemented that becomes one big change, really, is what it is, to create that physical hardiness. Find a way to strengthen your relaxation and uh, that response. You know, if your uh, stress response system is overactivated, you need to find ways to bring it down. You need to bring find ways to uh, bring those stress levels down. Relaxation skills, mindfulness, meditation, you know, a, a relaxing hobby. Uh, these are things that you can do to, to bring those stress levels down. Uh, believe it or not, our senses are very much tied to stress. Uh, they can be very much tied to stress. So soothing your senses can be actually very relieving of our stress response. Things like, you know, through sight, smell, sound, all of these things, tactile, sensory. Uh, you know, you could uh, go outside and, and just, you know, look at nature. 
You can look at puppies and kittens. That's what I love to do. Scrolling through all of the puppies and kittens out there in the world. Listen to some nature sounds, some music. You know, get some, uh, you know, uh, sensories uh, that are soothing. This helps bring you into a much more calm state overall. It's very difficult to feel stressed, you know, looking at puppies, smelling lavender, and listening to soothing nature sounds. It's very hard to be stressed when you're doing all those things. It really is. Identify your strengths. Sometimes we're really hard on ourselves. And we, we look at the things that we don't do right or that we didn't get right. The things that we could have done better. Find your strengths. You have personal strengths. Reflect on those. Remind yourself uh, of when you overcame challenges. And we are all sitting here today means we've overcome some challenges. And we could use some self-reflection on that positive aspect. Increase positive emotions on a daily basis. You know, find humor, find joy. Um, believe it or not, expressing gratitude to yourself, but not just yourself, to your others, to other people. Find your, your friend, your loved one, and say, you know what, man, I really, really appreciate you. I'm very grateful for you. It doesn't only feel good to you, it feels good to them. But believe it or not, it, that is a, a good thing. Expressing gratitude is, is very beneficial. It's a positive thing. It may seem awkward if you're running around telling everyone that how grateful you are, but then you stop feeling awkward and it starts becoming a normal thing. And then it's not so bad. And people like it. People love to be told that. So it's a good thing. Uh, and list your accomplishments. That's again, uh, it goes along with some of those strengths, but in a positive way, remembering to reflect on those. Meaningful activities, engage in them. Get out. I can't say it enough how important it is to get out. Get out. Do things. Do fun things. And then when you do things that are meaningful and fun and interesting, reflect on them. Don't just go, oh, that was nice, and then move on. Reflect on them. If it, it, it means talking to someone about them, these events, these, uh, these occurrences, or even journaling them, it's a way to reflect on those positive and meaningful experiences. And I can't uh, emphasize this enough, create a caring community. So this is finding people that are supportive and positive in your life and maintaining a connection with them. Having that connection. Um, sources of support. It could be friends. It could be fa a family member. It could be a therapist. could be a teacher. could be a neighbor. But staying connected with them and finding a positive uh, relationship with them so that you can practice good communication and learn good conflict resolution skills. Because often people who have, uh, have struggled with... Uh, the prolonged toxic stress response have difficulty with conflict and, and have difficulty with conflict resolution. Often we try to avoid it or it, it just doesn't go well. And, and it, it might be a heightened conflict uh, response. If you find people that are supportive of you and positive, it's easier to work on those skills, much easier to work on those skills. Counter unhelpful thinking. This is like the epitome of cognitive behavioral ther therapy. Turn those negative thoughts into positive thoughts. And, and that seems so awkward. If you're thinking of doing self talk and it's negative, it doesn't go, it's not very natural to be like, okay, I gotta stop thinking that way. But this is what I'm gonna tell myself. But if you do it enough, it starts becoming normal. Even if you, if it's so difficult in the beginning to change the negative thoughts to positive, even if you can somehow find a neutral thought and work your way towards positive thoughts, it, it, it helps to gradually get there. Because negative thinking is stress-inducing. It's very stress-inducing. So positive thinking is, is a, a very beneficial for someone who has had long-term uh, stress. Practice self-compassion. I can't say this enough. Be easier on yourselves. Be, you know, be grateful for yourself. Be kind to yourself. I can't say it enough. Be kind to yourself. 
It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to not be perfect. It's okay to have had a rough life. This is a part of life. And sometimes, and I, and I have a quote, I'm going to end this kind of on a positive note. Uh, and I really, truly believe this. You know, without the darkness, you would not appreciate the light. And I feel that. I don't feel like I would appreciate what I have right now to the extent that I have if I didn't experience what I experienced. Just, now, do I want to do it again? No. <laughs> but I have grown to appreciate life and where I'm at right now. So uh, I hope that you took something from this. I hope I gave you some positive things to work on and, and, and leave with. So um, thank you for allowing me to share uh, the information with you and some ways to counterbalance the ACEs that many of us uh, are kind of burdened with carrying around. Um, I'm happy to open this up to questions if anyone has any. I can't get past the two brains. Yeah. Uh, the the one that had been subject to deprivation. Yeah. If that child were put in a situation where it did he she did have support, did have loving, did have enough to eat, would the brain itself change? Would it reestablish connective pathways? A great question. We do see in childhood there are something called neuroplasticity. Uh, so, uh, especially in childhood, the neuroplasticity is basically the uh, the brain's ability to um, uh, grow, recover, and, and and make new connections. So, there is some hope. There is some hope. Questions. Wait, go ahead. Karen, then we'll go I, I just wanted, I, I don't need to, like, <laughs> I'm going to mess with, I'm going to mess it up somehow. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for your time. Oh, yes. Let us observe the presentation. Thank you for being here. I appreciate that. Wonderful. I hope it was interesting. Jody. So I have a couple questions. When you were reviewing um, your studies, did you find that there were um, one or a few instances that were particularly more detrimental than others? Neglect. Yeah. That, that that seemed to be one of the most prominent uh, physical and physical and emotional neglect seems to be there. And, and that you could see that evidence in the CT scan. Absolutely. Okay. Jody, it's your turn. Uh, did you find uh, with the uh, protective factors? Um, I could, you know, I'm interested in personality. Was there, I, and I saw that in resilience, there's definitely some personality characteristics that I would definitely put, like with the big five and things like that. But was there anything that you saw specifically with personality and resilience and some of the um, protective factors again? Opt ACEs? Optimism, and, yeah, uh, and agreeableness. Definitely, uh, optimism and agreeableness are are very much protective factors. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean by agreeableness? So um, just your ability to basically work with others and, and um, not necessarily that you agree with everything, but you can be a positive collaborator with others and, and um, basically show empathy and be able to kind of meet halfway on ideas, those types of things. Yeah. Question. Yes. Um, so how would uh, inconsistent paces affect uh, the resilience? Mm -hmm. Like if uh, paces were present for a few months at a time. That's still beneficial. Just having those experiences um, and being exposed to them shows kind of a different life, a different way of things. And it, and it can uh, change a child's frame of mind enough to have a huge impact. So even short-term cases can be very beneficial. <laughs> yeah. Is it possible uh, to have someone that is resilient for instance, and then at a period of time, later down, maybe get triggered, like later in adulthood where it pops up? 
Um, as far as the ACEs, is, is, as far, or the, the health impacts, yeah. I, I think if you look at the lifespan, absolutely. I mean, you could be completely healthy, but then later in life uh, have a health impact. And, and if you really look at it, um, that could shorten their lifespan. And, and that would be, could be directly influenced influenced by the number of aces they had so yeah it, it's not necessarily that oh you're 18 you're you're, you're going to be diabetic and have cancer like right at 18 it, this is a lifespan so we're seeing uh these individuals having these health implications at, at, at a greater prevalence than those who have zero aces regardless mm -hmm. yeah yeah any other questions Yes, In your research, did you find anything on uh, cortisol and its effect on long-term stress with like the toxic stress response? Yeah, and that was uh, part of that toxic stress is both the uh, the excessive release of cortisol and adrenal, uh, both it is really being released excessively, which is putting a person basically in fight or flight over a prolonged amount of time. And this is exactly what is 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 tying to that dysregulation in the immune system, the endocrine system, and the neurological system. We can see direct influences just from that excessive cortisol and adrenal being released. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, can you possibly take a note? The, take a look at the influence it has on the brain. Um, well, yeah, like uh, back to the uh, <clears throat> visuals, you mean? We'll go back there. So here was the, the one we were talking about with the brain. Uh, this is the three-year-old uh, struggled with severe neglect uh, versus a three-year-old, uh, a normal, a healthy three-year-old. So you can see it, the architecture of the brain. It is impacted uh, detrimentally. So that's that's one thing. Yeah, you're welcome. Other questions? Anybody? Oh, with, yeah. With generations changing, do you think we could expect to see more ACEs and more variations of cases pop up? What was the question? Sorry. Yeah. With uh, new generations, do you think we'll see new ACEs and cases develop? Um, that's, that's a good question. I, I wish I could see in the future. I'm hoping, my hope is that um, the more we learn and the more that we start implementing uh, kind of prevention programs, Arizona, uh, the state of Arizona has a, a, a targeted program that is targeting uh, a prevention and disruption of ACEs in childhood. Uh, across many states, the states have these prevention programs. Um, the more the community can get involved in these programs, the more we can see a better future. Absolutely. So that, that's where I'm hoping you'll go out there and you'll look for ways that you can help um, in some of these programs uh, for prevention of ACEs. Uh, because we can see that in childhood, children can experience ACEs, but when it's disrupted, by support and community, and like you said, those paces, it, it can really change a child's life, 100%, change their life. Do you have a, a website to direct us to? There is a ton. So uh, it's the Arizona St uh, State Health Services has a ton of information on ACEs. <laughs> and the CDC does. Yeah, if you look at if you look up Arizona um, uh, health services in Arizona for Arizona specifically, you can find the ACEs program there, so that you could have at least here within our community ways for you to help. Yeah, way back. Is the ACEs based on like the child's view of it, like how it affects the child, rather than like say the intentions of the parent? Um, it, it, the ACEs are typically provided to adults. So, or, or it's a medical provider gives an assessment. It can be, um, 
through uh, assessment it during health visits, those types of things. I don't think that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. What was that? Experiences with the adverse childhood experiences adverse based on the child's perspective rather than like yes. what was actually happening. Well, um, that kind of suggests maybe the child is. I, I mean, it. I hate to say, like, you know, that it, it, that you you're going to question a child if the child is experiencing what they feel to be neglect. Uh, that's their experience, and that's real. So, um, to what level, uh, you know, that that might be where things are a little bit questionable. But a lot of times when we're doing these assessments within the health field, there's confirmation through other family members. So it's not just one story. It's often a family story is what it is. Oh, back here. Go for it. Thank you. For you mentioned something about the generational effect of ACEs. Can you speak more on that? Um, to some extent, it is not my field of expertise, but it, we're seeing that generational toxic stress can actually change our DNA and the way that it's expressed, which when that's passed on through generations, now you have generational toxic stress. So that's where uh, you have this vulnerability. If your parents have experienced toxic stress, you might have these changes in your DNA in the DNA and the way that your DNA is interpreting the information that can actually make you more vulnerable to the toxic stress. So that's that generational impact. <laughs> um, is there um, adults who face adversity and traumatic experiences, is there a similar relationship with their health versus adverse childhood experiences and health? Um, there you know, stress can impact your health in general. Mm -hmm. um, it's really the long-term stress over childhood. I mean, we're developing across childhood, and that's what the ACEs is targeting. You definitely can have health implications when you're dealing with stress as an adult, and, and stress can be long-term in adulthood as well. Um, it is what we're seeing is, is probably less specific to the developmental damage and more related to things like immune function, all of that is what you're is what is probably happening more. And and even um, cognitive impairment. Has anyone ever been so stressed that they just can't seem to remember things or do well on an exam or or manage those things? That's that that's going to impact. So definitely, yeah. Um, in your approach, ACEs and or bipolar, and if so, is there one specific mental illness? I, there is, and I, yes, yes. Any of, our, it, there is a lot of correlation between uh, many of mental illness, factors of mental illness, different ones that we're seeing, depression is obviously our primary, suicide, uh, you know, bipolar disorder, these are, are often very much, um, uh, kind of expressed at a greater degree uh, with the higher number of ACEs. So there, there isn't just one, unfortunate one. You can kind of see it across the board. I don't know if there's any of these, uh, any of the ACE studies, like in second or third world countries, or would they apply the same kind of? Um, I, I, oh, uh, ACE studies that have gone across the world. Oh, yeah. Second or third world countries. Yeah. Um, I didn't see anything uh, like as far as second or third world. I most of the research I saw was in, you know, westernized uh, societies. Um, I can't imagine that. That it, we wouldn't see the same results if you have children um, struggling, you know, through war and yeah. things like that. As, absolutely. You would probably see the same same issues. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, because like in Afghanistan, if you gave some of the kids there that I saw, they would easily be minimum number would probably be an eight. Yes. But the problem is, is you you definitely need to take culture into account when you're doing assessing. So the assessment may look different. It may very much look different. Yeah. I just wanted to re-emphasize what you talked about earlier with resilience. 
Yes. We are built as human beings to be resilient. Yes, we are. If you're looking at a distribution, then the majority of the people are going to get over whatever it is. Yes. Yes. So some people mistakenly think that um, if you go through something really traumatic, that that's it. You're going to have PTSD. Right. Yeah. PTSD is a diagnosis for some people. Yes. And you talked about the different types of uh, personalities, genetics. There's so many different things yes. involved. But overall, we can be resilient. Yeah. We're, we're kind of built that way. Yes. So don't expect that if you go through something traumatic, that that's it. Life's going to be horrible for you. Yeah. It's very true. Yeah. I mean, and there's also a small percentage you have that you also touched on post traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. So it can actually be better for you, like you said, to yeah. have face, yeah. to have gone through that. Yeah. So, I mean, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Because I wouldn't even have an interest in, in this in this field if it wasn't for my experiences growing up. And resilience, yeah, we are all capable of resilience. It's it's learning how to tap into it is really what um, some of us need to do that I think is important. Is there any other questions? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.